The year that I scored Thomas and Magic Railroad was actually a very busy career uh, year. In fact, I had been up to Toronto to record an IMAX film just months prior. And it was interesting that both of these projects were recorded in uh, Toronto. The other thing that was interesting is that several months before that, I also scored another film starring Peter Fonda. The funny story about how I got Thomas is that I ended up being in Los Angeles doing meetings as I usually do. I, live, uh, I was living at that time at an, on an island outside of Seattle. What happened is that I was in my office and my agent had been trying to get hold of the production company to try to get me an interview for the job and it had some problems reaching people. So I said, I'm in my office, I'm just gonna put my phone on auto dial and I'll keep on dialing and dialing and finally got through. And when I got hold of somebody, a live human being, what ended up happening is that they told me that the director, Britt Alcroft, was then in Los Angeles, because she didn't live in Los Angeles either. She was in Los Angeles interviewing composers that day. And so I said, is there any way that I can run over to her place and drop some stuff off? And they allowed me to take a bunch of CDs. I took a seven or eight CDs of my soundtracks and ran over to Britt's house in Santa Monica and handed them off to the housekeeper. By the time I got back to my office, there was already a message on my machine that Britt wanted to meet with me. So I ran back to Santa Monica and had a meeting with Britt, and uh, we sat there talking for about an hour, and then I had to catch a plane to go back to Seattle, and the next morning I was hired for the job. So it was a very, uh, it, it was meant to be. I mean, I was also very familiar with the material because my two daughters had grown up watching Shining Time Station, and were familiar with Thomas and all the other characters on Shining Time Station. There, Mott. The paint job's finished. I reckon Shining Time is the best welcome sight of any town in our valley. When I first got involved with the Thomas project, the film was still in rough cut, and they were doing some test screenings. Most of the, the diehard Thomas fans are aware that there was an original script that had another character in it. And unfortunately, at one of the screenings, they brought in an audience that was mostly four and five-year-olds who loved, loved the movie when Thomas was on camera, but as soon as the live action people were on camera alone, they got very fidgety. Basically, it was recommended that they pull out one of the characters and make it more Thomas and the Thomas and, and his friends centric. Oh, if Diesel has unfinished business, there's sure to be trouble right around the corner. Britt did so, and I know she was not very happy about that. So I never got to score that because the changes were made before I actually was, was scoring the film. I had already written the themes because the songs existed, but um, the other uh, character, P.T. Boomer, was taken out of basically, uh, you know, proverbial lost on the cutting room floor. Uh, there's one small problem there, Tom. Yeah, Mr. Conductor's coming and he won't let you destroy. Uh, he won't let you. No. Nah. I can do whatever I want. I'll get him too <laughs> with pinch. <laughs> yeah. I was at this, the now infamous screening with the four year olds, and, uh, you know, Britt was very upset because she felt that she was really making a family movie, not a children's movie. And that taking out P.T. Boomer, I think they took out P.T. Boomer to try to simplify this plot line and also to have less humans on camera and more of the trains on camera. Let's hope this one's just passing through. Like yourself, P.T. Boomer. I am passing through. Right on through into that mountain. I had a great time scoring this film. I ended up being allowed to write three songs for the movie. I uh, wrote one with my lyricist Sue Ennis and two with lyricist Don Black. Um, they became the main themes of the movie. This Is Your Shining Time became the main theme for Shining Time Station and for the basically the underlying story. Climbing through stars to your own cloud nine Soft strokes of lightning Paint the skies brightening Up all your There was a piece called I Know How the Moon Must Feel, and that became Lily's theme. And then there was uh, Some Things Never Leave You, which became Burnett's theme. And it was more of a solemn kind of waltz. The man with the sparkle told me one day one of his family would return. But until then, to guard her well, young Burnett. But I didn't guard you well. I just don't seem to understand about about magic. Strangely enough, 
not all the scenes that they were originally written for ended up in the film. Unfortunately, the film went through some changes at the last minute, and one of the scenes that was, there was Burnett and his wife Tasha, as young, younger people, were dancing to the song. Hello. Junior? Whoa! Junior? <laughs> Junior? Junior, what are you doing up there? Come down! It's too windy! This is just like the fun fair! Basically what happens is that whenever a composer is starting to work on a film, you watch the film and try to figure the best way of translating the visuals into a musical statement. And the thing that I knew about Thomas, and that and I would say that whether Britt actually told me this or it was, just came out through conversation, was not to play down to the kids. You know, even though it was, it was not necessarily a, a, a children's movie, it was not, uh, you know, she didn't want anybody feeling like they were played down to. And in fact, it's very interesting because one of the songs that I wrote, the uh, Shining Time, uh, This Is Your Shining Time, has a very challenging melody. The original idea was there was going to be a woman, a girl, a young woman, singing that song. And Britt made the rather astute observation that where the, we hear the song the first time in the film is right after Mr. Conductor talks, and so it should be sung by a man. So now we already had the track done, we had everything finished, and it was like, oh, okay, so now we have to find a guy who can sing in the right range. And we brought in a couple of singers who actually couldn't sing the melody because it was too challenging for them. So, have you ever ridden a horse before? No. And so there was a lot of things that I tried to do where I was getting much hipper melodic content and much hipper harmonic content, but still it had to be, you know, it's a fantastical world. It's Thomas and Talking Trains, but it couldn't all be fantastical. So I saved the more fantastical type of music for when they were transitioning from uh, Shining Time to Muffled Mountain. And so when they're traveling through the, the Magic Railroad, along the Magic Railroad. So there were, there were points where it had to be fantastical, but it, couldn't, it could never play down to the children. And that was one of the things that, that Britt was very adamant about. It is dark and cold and bumpy, but I'm not afraid. Ooh, there's the missing coal truck. Coal truck? Stoke up the magic in the mountain. That's part of Mr. Conductor's clue to his gold dust. This was kind of a dream project. I had a, a very generous budget. I mean, I was able to hire, I think it was an 85 or 90 piece orchestra. A lot of composers these days do mock-ups of electronic mock-ups of their entire score. And Britt didn't require that of me. She heard the themes, but pretty much Britt was kind of hands-off and she really trusted me a lot, which I really appreciated. <laughs> 